The U.S. government just updated GDP for the fourth quarter and still as strong as ever. The U.S. economy appears to be invulnerable, yet recessions keep spreading around the rest of the world. If you can't shake that nagging feeling the rest of the world might really matter, that's because it actually does, and far more than people realize. We keep hearing about decoupling, but that's not how the global economy works because it is a global economy. That's not how it ever really worked. The idea of globally synchronized goes back a very, very long way. In fact, the world's very first quantitative easing episode was in response to a globally synchronized recession. And I don't mean 2008. I'm talking about 2001. The world economy is a world economy. And when there's a lot of pieces in that world economy that are suffering substantial setbacks, it's going to be a problem for everyone. No matter how it looks along the way, a globally synchronized cycle is still a globally synchronized cycle. And more and more evidence continues to pile in in 2024. The cycle remains on the downswing. But let's go back to 2001 to really drive home this point. Globally synchronized, it's not anything new. The modern economy is interconnected and interwoven. Whether we ever realize it or not, because the financial media and economics has done such a poor job of educating the public, this has been the case for a long time. So let's go back a little bit over 20 years to 2001 and the very first QE, which means we're talking about the Japanese. Now, in the United States, the U.S. economy fell into a very shallow recession in the second quarter of 2001, and there weren't actually two straight quarters of of negative GDP either, therefore showing that a recession can happen whether or not it's a technical one or not. Because the, the recession in 2001 was relatively shallow, many people didn't realize it was happening as it was happening. Most attention was focused on the dot com bust that kept on busting through the year 2001, and then, of course, the tragedy in September 2001, which many people associated with the downturn in the economy. But it actually goes back to global weakness, somewhat tied to the dot-com bust from the year before. So even entering 2001, the worldwide situation was questionable enough that even the Japanese were thinking, we better do something drastic. Bank of Japan's statement announcing what it was intending to do with quantitative easing, the very first paragraph says this. This is March 19th of 2001. Japan's economic recovery has recently come to a pause after it slowed in late 2000 under the influence of a sharp downturn of the global economy. Prices have been showing weak developments and there is concern about increased downward pressure on prices stemming from weak demand. And they mean weak demand, not just in in terms of Japan, but also around the rest of the world. Weak global economy. As Kazuo Ueda said in May of 2001, downside risks to the Japanese economy have increased sharply since the fall of last year, as both the U.S. economy and the IT IT boom turned downward. The downturns have hit the new economy hardest. And he means, again, global, new economy globally. I hasten to add that GDP may have expanded at a reasonable rate in the second half of last fiscal year, which ended in March, meaning Q4 2000 and Q1 2001. But going forward, the downside risks have just characterized are the major concern. Such was the background for our monetary policy decisions in the last quarter. Again, he's basically saying, and Ueda, by the way, is the the current Bank of Japan governor. What he was saying is that we turned to QE because we were worried our economic recovery was going to be short-circuited by the growing global recession, which, by the way, it actually was. When you look at GDP, as he was saying, it looked relatively decent and stable to end 2000. GDP was up around 1% quarter over quarter in the fourth quarter of 2000 and nearly three, a little bit over three quarters of a percent in the first quarter of 2001. And in that first quarter of 2001, along comes the Bank of Japan to do QE because they don't know what else to do. Did it work? No, it didn't. The next three quarters in Japan, Q2, 2001, Q3, and Q4, so the, the balance of that year, 2001, GDP turned negative and pretty solidly negative in the second and third quarters, which means 
the globally synchronized recession that definitely hit the United States actually did interrupt the Japanese recovery and send it plummeting back into a deflationary mindset as well as recession. So again, what, what good was QE? In fact, they actually did a second QE because of the recession. So even the Japanese, which you would think was an economy unto itself, an island after a lost decade, was still getting impacted negatively by global developments, globally synchronized. And it wasn't just Japan, of course. We look around the rest of the world in 2001 and you see the same thing. Over in Europe, the brand new or relatively new ECB and its, its president, Dr. Willem Duesenberg, 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 I'll, call, I'll go with Duesenberg. In June of 2001, he gave a speech which was titled, what exactly is the responsibility of central banks of large economic areas in the current slowdown of the world economy? Because many people were turning to the, e the ECB and to Europe to say, the rest of us are experiencing recession. Can you help us out here? Maybe do a little bit of European stimulus to help out a, a global economic system that is suffering a substantial downturn. It was worse than a, it was worse than a downturn. It was actually an outright recession. And what he said was, yeah, that's not really our job. But I understand the problem because we see the pressure hitting Europe too. He said, the topic of the introduction I've been invited to provide at the Central Bankers Panel is both challenging and welcome. The challenge is to answer a question that has been hovering around in recent months. Should the Euro area assume the role of a global growth engine in the current slowdown of the world economy? This notwithstanding, the euro area is not, of course, economically speaking, an island. And global developments do affect the euro area economy. Hence, let me also stress that one of the requirements of a globalized world is a frequent exchange of information and views among policymakers. And what he was saying is that, you know, we feel bad for everyone else, but it's not our job to bail anyone else out, especially since Europe was going to have an increasing amount of its own problems too. As it would turn out, the European economies, which, which back then it was, they were thought of as more national economies than an integrated European economy, but they weren't. It was, again, part of the global economy. But the individual European economies, many of them had already suffered into recession as well, globally synchronized. Look at Germany, for example. Germany, which was a mess at the time, they had contractions in GDP in the third and fourth, fourth quarter of the year before in 2000. So the dot-com bust was busting a whole lot of places around the world, including Germany. Then they had a big rebound in the first quarter of 2001 and followed by second quarter of 2001, consistent with Japan and the United States. Germany actually, actually suffered four more contractions in GDP, an entire further year of negative output, globally synchronized. France had it a little bit better. They had slow growth in the second quarter of 2001, a small acceleration in the third quarter, and then a small negative in the fourth quarter. You put that together and it is a very, very mild recession in France. Italy was basically exactly the same as Japan, as Europe's third largest economy. That made a big difference, which means three straight negatives from the second quarter of 2001 on. Even the timing is quite synchronized. The same three quarters as Japan, the same three quarters as the United States. Dutch GDP, another one, another big one that is, a more, that, is, that is characterized as a more stable economy. They had a slow quarter in the first quarter of 2001, even before the globally synchronized recession. Then another slow quarter in the third quarter before a negative quarter in the first quarter of 2002. So even the Dutch economy, one of the more steady and stable systems there are, that one experienced a more than slowdown in 2001 as well. How about emerging markets? China, a very big one. The Chinese in 2001, it, their experience in terms of general output wasn't as bad as the Asian not financial crisis in 97 and 98, but it was still a substantial setback in 2001. You look at GDP. Nominal GDP fell under 9% by the fourth quarter of 2001. That was, up from, that was down from double digits. Real GDP, there was a dip there as well. You see a moderate dip in retail sales because there was still a lot of investment coming into China. That didn't stop with the 2001 recession. It would take a euro dollar crisis to stop that. Then, but you do see a substantial slowdown in things like industrial production. 
IP in China slowed from double digits down to around 8% by July of 2001, and then got down to 2.7% year over year at the start of 2002, which was an incredible slowdown for the Chinese industrial engine. And the reason was huge, huge, massive drop off in trade. Exports alone, uh, exports into Ch exports from China to the rest of the world were growing at a 40% yearly rate in the third quarter of 2000. That dropped down to basically flat, almost zero, in the fourth quarter of 2001, as the global economy fell into recession in those three quarters of 2001, obviously the Chinese were experiencing an impact. At, good for them at the time, at least they had that rush of investment still coming in to cushion the blow. But it was still a sizable and substantial blow nonetheless. There was very little shelter from the globally synchronized downturn because it is a global economy. And it's not just the 21st century, as maybe you're imagining now. It goes all the way back. Go back to the 1970s. I mean, first of all, the Great Inflation. The Great Inflation was not a U.S.-only phenomenon. It was a global phenomenon because of the Eurodollar system expanding rapidly all over the world. So you had a global Great Inflation, and at the end of the 70s, you had a global recession which was increasingly nasty as 1980 became 81 and then in 1982. I've talked about the 1979 recession before. In the United States, it was, as the FOMC characterized, the most advertised recession in history. Everybody could see it coming, but it wasn't just the United States. There was weakness spreading around the rest of the world. As the FOMC discussed in October of 1979, there's a, there's a conversation here that really gets to the heart of the issue. Um, Nancy Teeters asked, the possibility does exist that we could get a worldwide recession. And the response was, well, from our models, and this is Ted Truman, in only one of the major countries do we have what we call a recession or negative growth, but we do have economic activity in all the major countries dropping down, essentially growing at half the rate over the next four quarters, that's into 1980, that they had, they had over the previous four quarters, 1978 into 1979. And the last four quarters have been affected to some extent by oil prices in 1979. But it wasn't just oil prices. And the Federal Reserve's models were being overly optimistic, as they tend to be. Because the world would indeed suffer a substantial slowdown in 79 and then be pushed into a recession, which many countries struggled to get out of in the entire first couple years of the 1980s. We got a double dip recession in the United States. Many countries were just in a single prolonged recession all together at once. As the IMF reported in 1989, the process of wringing out inflationary pressures also brought on a deep global recession in the early 1980s. Every region of the world except Asia experienced marked declines in the growth of output. And the majority of the world's countries recorded one or more years of negative growth. Neither the causes nor the symptoms of the cyclical downturn were unusual, except that the primacy of inflation reduction as a policy goal made the adjustment more wrenching than in previous post-war episodes. In other words, we do have globally synchronized recessions going back really to the 1940s. There are instances throughout the world where we can see common patterns, common cycles, it wasn't just 2008. It wasn't just 2001. It wasn't just the 1970s. We have been living in a more globally integrated and synchronized economy than we have ever been led to believe. And it goes way, way back. If one part of the economy starts to experience trouble, that's one thing. That's something to be concerned about. But as that trouble spreads to other parts of the global economy, it means that nowhere is, are you going to be spared. There isn't a place to hide. The old adage, the economic cliche, whenever the U.S. sneezed, the rest of the world caught a cold. And that was just a recognition of how globally synchronized the system had been with some U.S. nativism thrown in as, as the cause behind it all. But it wasn't, it wasn't about U.S. demand strictly, though that was a prim primary point of contagion throughout the global system. It was the fact that there was a highly integrated global system. And keep coming back to Paul Krugman in 2016, who was forced into this realization because of the Japanese experience, which 
Again, neo-Keynesian economists think that these are all these national economies are indeed national economies. They're bathtubs. They're islands. They're 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 just individual systems with very little links between them. As Krugman was forced to realize, that's just not true. That when we have a problem in Europe, that can lead to recession in Japan. When you have a recession in Japan, that is going to mean problems not just in emerging markets with the great migration, as I talked about in a recent video, but more so direct economic and financial impacts. And as China showed, the direct impact is usually through trade, which has an enormous impact on many places and in many businesses and in many settings. But it goes beyond just trade. Trade is just where it begins. You have sentimental effects, risk aversion, not just in terms of markets, but also in general economic. You don't want to grow your business if your customers around the rest of the world are experiencing a recession. So you, you pull back in stuff that you're doing at home. There are financial impacts. There are monetary impacts. There are a number of different channels that are available for problems to proliferate and spread throughout this globally synchronized economy. As more and more economies slipped into recession to end last year, unexpected recession, of course, let's keep that in mind, that is a warning to everyone in the global system. More, this weakness is spreading through it. Globally synchronized may not mean exactly synchronized as far as timing. It's a warning, despite the fact that U.S. GDP looks absolutely stellar. Although, when you take a closer look beyond GDP, some of the other statistics look like some of the other countries around the rest of the world, too. So even the weakness has already begun to spread inside the U.S. as well. Unfortunately, we didn't get the GDI in, uh, numbers for the fourth quarter. Those are delayed by an extra month every time we get to the fourth quarter, which, as we've seen before, GDI does not agree with GDP on the state of the U.S. economy either. You look at GDI compared to, say, Germany or Japan GDP, it looks a lot like it. Globally synchronized, maybe after all. And that's really the point here. We've had a globally integrated economy for a very long time. What are the chances that this time will be different? More than just the statistics, regular folks, Americans, people around the world can feel the recession coming. They can feel like it's a recession now. Talking about why people feel like there's a recession, that's in the video linked below. As always, I thank you very much for joining me. Huge thank you, Eurodollar University members and subscribers. Until next time, take care.